Welcome everybody to this fourth in the Australian Open Access Support Group's webinar series. My name is Susanna Sabine, I'm the Executive Officer for the AOASG. I'd like to welcome today to a uh, big welcome today to our panel members from all across the country. We have Ross Coleman from the University of Sydney, we have Mal Booth from the University of Technology in Sydney, we have Dr John Emerson from the University of Adelaide Press, we have Lorena I don't know how to pronounce your last name, sorry about that, from ANU Press here at Australian National University and Dr Nathan Hollier from Monash University Publishing at Monash University. Ross, I would ask you please if you could to chair the session as, as Roxanne Missingham, the ANU Librarian and the AOASG Deputy Chair um, is unable to do so today. Ross. Okay, thanks Susanna. I guess uh, initially um, all of us give a bit of um, background to uh, uh, what we do, uh, how it relates to the open uh, access agendas at the various institutions or the various publishers, uh, and uh, start off that way and just see how the conversation goes with some prompts from either uh, people listening or some other questions we have. So if that's a reasonable start, I can uh, I can start off. Yep. Um, so um, I'm the director of uh, collection digital and scholarship services at the University of Sydney Library. Now, that covers quite a range. It includes the uh, Sydney University Press, which operates as a, I guess as a hybrid publisher uh, with part commercial, partly open access. It includes um, uh, OJS as an open publishing platform. It includes the digital repositories that we run. Uh, and we run a, a, a series, a cascading series of those, depending if they're dark, grey or open. Um, on the other hand, they also manage the uh, collections and of course we're interested in terms of um, uh, collection development and how the open access agenda is impacting on that. Uh, as a bit of background at the University of Sydney, we are in the final throes of putting through an open access policy. Uh, it's been through extensive consultation across the university committees, research committees, faculty committees, uh, through our legal office twice. Um, it is coming out as a fairly um, uh, uh, light document, uh, into, well, a short document, light document, which covers both uh, access to publications, access to data, and access to digital theses uh, in terms of the open access agenda. Um, one of the interesting things perhaps relevant to this uh, conversation, which has come out as part of our policy, but has also come out as the recent uh, GOA statement on open access to research outputs, is the uh, requirement for the university to provide open, uh, open publishing platforms to facilitate the rapid and open communication of research. So um, in some form, open publishing platforms are enshrined in university policy, uh, the delegation to that to that policy is uh, from the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research through to the library to provide those platforms. So we see that as the library being quite embedded in that process. So that's a bit of an introduction from me. Perhaps uh, Mal, you want to give a bit of a an overview? Uh, yep, um, I'm from University of Technology Sydney. <clears throat> we have um, last week, oh this week, celebrated the. Uh, 10th anniversary of UTSE Press, which is our uh, open access publisher. It's not hybrid, it's just open access. Um, so we, I think we're the largest publisher of open access scholarly journals in Australasia still. We've got about 15 of those, they're all still pretty active um, and now all listed with DOAJ. Uh, and we also publish monographs. We've been doing normal monograph publishing, open access monograph publishing for a while now, but we're in the process of setting up an editorial board to give it um, further um, credibility uh, as a scholarly press. <clears throat> we don't have that in the mono side at the moment, each of the, the journals does. Um, and we're experimenting quite a bit in the monograph space. We're launching um, the second of a series of nine media object books, which, which I can discuss later. Uh, this afternoon, actually, um, this one's on on voice presence and absence, um, and it's they're all about uh, the way um, we can document practice uh, 
based projects that are not primarily based in text in a scholarly format. And I don't think anyone else in the world is doing anything like that, certainly not traditional publishing. Um, and we have a, an open access policy which we put through. Uh, I think we got that through finally last year sometime. So um, in many ways, we're the centre of that uh, for the university. And uh, we have a, a role that I think probably needs to be stronger as well in open access data uh, and the way that's perhaps coordinated uh, collaboratively across the university. That's probably enough for me from UTS. John, John Emerson. Uh, howdy. Um, I set up the University of Adelaide Press uh, at the end of 2008, beginning of 2009, just to publish um, monographs or edit, edited collections. So we don't do journals and we don't have any involvement in any um, sort of um, archiving or anything like that. And the way we work is we have a open access, a free edition, which is a PDF. Uh, and occasionally I've experimented with other formats, but the PDF is still our primary one. And we also have a complementary print edition and our model is quite close to ANU's um, in some ways, but uh, the whole process, in fact, we run the University Press searches. We, we go out looking for the manuscripts. We then vet the manuscripts, send them on peer review, um, run the editorial process, and then the design process, and, and then the eventual publication. And so far we've done 40, um, books and um, the University of Adelaide hasn't itself got an open, a formal open access policy. But, um, the, you know, and you might need to stay closer to your microphone or turn it up a bit. I don't even know where, where it is. Is that better? I've got the earbuds. <laughs> occasionally it's good and occasionally you go wander away from it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm afraid if that's the case, I don't know what to do. Um, yeah. Stand fine at the moment. I'll hold up the cord, uh, maybe that's easier. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so no open access for our policy forms in the University of Adelaide, uh, and we just do what is probably the essence uh, for us. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, Lorena? Hi, um, so my surname is Canalopoulos. It is a bit of a mouthful, but for those of you that wanted to know my, my full name, um, I'm the manager of ANU Press and have been since the inception of the press back in 2003. I'm also, as part of my portfolio, I'm also responsible, responsible for digital repositories within the Australian National University. Um, the press celebrated its 10 year um, anniversary um, this year. And also one of the major milestones was that we um, also published over 500 titles since um, the establishment. So we've been operational since 2003. Um, we publish between 50 to 60 titles a year, which includes six journals. Um, the press has three imprints, um, the first being the Herdic approved high quality brand, which is ANU Press. Um, the next one being ANU EView, which is internally um, reviewed by um, colleagues or or a particular board within um, the ANU structure and focuses on student, student journals, but there's also monographs there. And our latest um, imprint is ANU eText, and which um, we, we published our first um, eText this year. Um, we do have an ANU open access um, policy, which was approved this year. And, um, yeah, so looking forward to this discussion on the webinar. Yeah, thanks, Lorena. No worries. Uh, Nathan. Hi, yes, Nathan Holly, a Director of Monash University Publishing. Uh, we publish uh, books and journals. We publish about 20 to 25 books uh, a year, and we're now down to just one journal. Uh, although having some discussions with other journal uh, uh, editors. Uh, 
Uh, we're based in the library. I report to the Director of Research Infrastructure in the library at Monash, who also looks after the uh, library's repository. One of the items on our charter, there's about five or six uh, items on our charter, and one of them is to promote the, the um, uh, free exchange of knowledge where possible. Uh, and we try to abide by the uh, Australia Research Council's policy on, um, on open access, that is uh, publishing uh, the title open access uh, within 12 months uh, in some format after the, uh, the, the publication date, after the initial publication date. Uh, and sometimes we publish open access uh, you know, from, from the outset. The university doesn't have uh, as yet its own uh, formalised open access policy uh, at Monash. And uh, in, in general, we treat the open access uh, question for our titles on a case by case basis. And for, for various reasons, uh, commercial reasons partly. We don't always uh, do titles open access. Uh, the, other, the other factor there tends to be that sometimes authors uh, don't want their work to be made open access and sometimes that's really for uh, emotional reasons or, or for reasons of um, uh, Not sure. I'm trying to think of a, a, another word from prejudice, but uh, basically a, a, a sense that that's the proper way that uh, that things should be done. So we try and ex explain to authors about the benefits of open access, and quite often um, they come around, and and quite often authors are, are keen on it from the beginning. But um, that's uh, in a nutshell our our publishing and and where open access fits in. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Nathan. I, I guess, uh, Susanna, we can take questions uh, through the open webinar. Um, we'll do that, yes. Yeah. But, uh, um, I guess I forgot to mention actually to everybody as we started that if you want to do um, any questions, you can put them in the chat box or the Q and A box. And in fact, we actually have one here, which says, "Could Ross please provide more information about the recent GO8 open access statement? I haven't been able to find it on the GO8 website." Okay, it was released last week. Um, it's a one-page one statement um, uh, which um, uh, in the preamble, group of uh, aid is committed to the widest possible communication of research and scholarship to the global community. Um, there's a number of points there. I, I won't re read them all, but it's talking about the broadest possible access to knowledge and information created by publicly funded research. Uh, the contemporary research practice and knowledge creation requires rapid, rapid unfettered and global communication. Um, and it says the GO8 universities will develop governance, will develop governance frameworks, services and infrastructure, including repositories to facilitate the broadest possible dissemination, assist grant funding bodies to continue to develop their OA policies, provide open publishing platforms to facilitate rapid and open communication, so we have an access to publicly funded research and engage with the publishing community to achieve sustainable models for open access. Um, I'm happy to, Ross, it's a public you, document. Yep, Ross, if you could send me the link, I'll make sure that it gets put up on the AOSG Twitter feed and it goes out on the website as well. Okay. Um, for everybody. Okay. Um, I guess the other, uh, the, the other common aspect of uh, all of us who are on this panel here, uh, we're based in libraries. So it's kind of a, um, uh, certainly at Sydney, it's a, a strategic decision to have the press run out of the library. Um, it's been confirmed uh, through a review last year of the University Press with a new advisory board chaired by the University Provost. And I think it recognises that publishing fits in a wider kind of digital uh, repository, data sharing context as well. There's a whole range of things around what's called scholarly communication and uh, a university press or an e-press of some sort that, that publishes 
uh, material uh, uh, with a, a certain uh, peer review quality uh, is a critical part of that. So uh, certainly in Sydney, there's a commitment to, to that process at the moment. We've just gone through a, uh, just gone through a restructure, which in fact strengthens the, the uh, capacity around scholarly publishing. So if anyone has a, another comment in terms of uh, how libraries fit into this process of scholarly communication as opposed to uh, other publishing groups on campus or commercial publishers, it'd be interesting to see or to hear. Well, perhaps not. <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on. Well, uh, just, sorry, someone else go. Well, I was going to say, uh, I'm not, um, this is Nathan again. Uh, the, it, at, uh, at Monash, at any rate, I think that uh, without, uh, I think that there is a bit of a lack of understanding at times within uh, senior levels of the university about the potentially competing roles of a university, of a library based uh, press with open access um, uh, agenda and uh, commercial uh, presses. And, uh, you know, that is a bit of a, um, a bit of a difficulty when we're talking with uh, other parts of the university about what we do. And of course, our library based presses tend to be um, cost centres within the university, whereas yeah. the uh, commercial presses are in theory at any rate, um, yeah revenue centres. So um, uh, I'll just make that point really about uh, the, uh, more, there is more work to be done on um, putting the case for the value of, uh, of the open access publishing within, within the university, I think. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree. That was Nathan, wasn't it, I think? Yes. yes. There's Mal here. Um, I agree with that to some extent, but um, it's a little bit different here. We don't have a commercial press. Um, so although we are seen as a bit of a load, it's run on the, uh, on the smell of an oily rag. It's not an awful load and it's borne mostly by the library uh, robbing from Peter to pay Paul. But uh, we, we are really the centre of open access here and the press, the scholarly press, um, in the library, I mean, and the scholarly press is only one aspect of that. And I think I'm constantly telling people that um, that one aspect can't exist alone. It, it needs to exist as part of a, an open access environment. And that includes the, our other efforts with the um, prosecuting the open access mandate, uh, what we're doing with, um, with general citation and bibliometric analysis of UTS um, research uh, publication elsewhere, um, the open access repository, um, how we're lifting the standards of the and of the quality of the output in both the journals and the monographs, um, our relationship to academic board and the subcommittees of academic board um, in um, advocating the use of, of that as a publishing press and providing an output for certain elements of the university and then explaining to people that, um, that whilst uh, this is a bit of a cost um, in one way, it's, uh, it's more of a sustainable future for the university than the cost in other ways when we're giving away our research to traditional publishers and then the library is boosted by millions of dollars uh, to, to purchase that research back in the form of um, our databases, mainly ePress and, and you know, some of the monographs we're purchasing. So um, we're, I think we're ahead of the game and, and although its value is hard to measure in a tangible sense, it's still a bit of an intangible. I think it is a sustainable step towards the future of, uh, of, of, of research publishing. Uh, and it's also importantly, I think, if we can be a bit more innovative, it's it's one that's more in step with the way the things are being altruistically shared on the web, uh, on the free web, and we can relate to that. We can easily do things that relate better to aggregators than traditional presses will because of the restrictions they suffer from and their need to uh, generate revenue for um, their stakeholders um, or shareholders. So I think we're a bit more agile. We have the capability to be even more agile than we are, and we've certainly made it a... Um, a priority for our press to do more experimentation in the format uh, in which we publish and the ways in which we publish 
um, and and that has had some success. But like Nathan, I'd have to say that um, that I've had a couple of uh, run-ins with very senior academics, deans, who don't believe um, in what we're doing and believe that uh, that the academics that work for them who, who are doing work for us as either journal managers or editors or contributors are just giving their work away and, and they're paying for them and, and, and despite me saying, well, the university has to pay in one way or the other, we either pay to buy the stuff back or uh, we, you know, and we're not paying that much for these people to contribute to it. But those who do contribute, I have to say, um, you know, in some ways against their dean's own wishes, uh, are really enthusiastic about what they're doing and they really, the younger academics really believe that this is the way of the future. And the, uh, some of them are dedicating quite a lot of their um, their own time to getting these publications off the ground, um, particularly this series of nine media objects that we're launching this afternoon. Um, uh, Lorena from ANU. Um, yes, it's got a lot to do with um, obviously having senior um, academics or executive um, promoting the press within your university and campaigning it and, and, you know, giving them, you know, life stories about the advantages in publishing with a, an electronic press as opposed to a traditional publisher. And mm. that takes time. You know, um, we have academics that have been publishing with the, the top-notch publishers for years and, and you know, that, that they've got a certain mindset and that will take, you know, a long time for them to look at the, the advantages of publishing with an electronic press. Not only, um, you know, you can sit there and talk about, ex, you know, the amount of exposure that you're going to get and dissemination and lower costs and quicker turnaround time and you can, you know, throw all the bells and whistles at them. But at the end of the day, until they actually experience or have a colleague come and tell you, you know, this is the way of the future, um, and, you know, um, I thought this was brilliant because it, it, the turnaround time was anywhere between two to four months or, or six months as opposed to two to five years for their work to be published. Yeah, uh, Lorena and I, uh, with our presses, uh, had uh, some software done so that we could measure the uh, accurately the... Um, the readership of the open access titles that we're doing and uh, the statistics particularly of ANU have been really impressive there but when we you know we can take those metrics to the the uh, the powers that be within the university and say uh, you know we've had this many thousand readers of this title which otherwise would in all likelihood would have had uh, you know uh, a handful of people reading yeah. it it's still hard then to uh, that doesn't that there's not a an accepted measure of saying okay well that's worth such and such amount of dollars so that uh, those still will say okay well that's great but um you know you, you've still got your financial pressures which you uh, need to meet right it's just a question that's come through uh, from Francis O'Neill about uh, any experience of PJ um P W R uppercase J. I'm not quite sure um, if anyone has any experiences with that. No, I'm not quite sure what it is. No. Yeah. What is it? What is it? <laughs> well, while you're thinking about that, um, <laughs> Lorena, I'd just like to go back to your comment about having someone, some colleague that's done it, that this is the way of getting the other academics to sort of get on the open access bandwagon. Do you have a story around that of someone that has actually gone the open access route and has been really successful and has been able to bring others um, sort of into the fold, I suppose? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll mention people that I'm allowed to mention, so to speak, and why I say that is because I've, um, I'm sure they won't mind me mentioning their book and, and their experience. And one person in particular is Professor James Fox, which is the chair of our board now. But he had a, we needed some, some books that we needed to test our infrastructure with, our technology, before we were, 
you know, officially launched in 2004. And his book is called Out of the Ashes. Um, and his book was originally published by another publisher and it, then it was out of print and then we republished it with a new introduction and a few, a couple of chapters. Um, he, he was um, a really fantastic um, champion of the press because the amount of emails he received or invitations in regards to the the subject nature his, of his book, he's been able to travel overseas and give talks and write additional chapters to other books. Um, he has received extra Cal payments um, and the amount of downloads that he's received, um, um, you know, have out uh, um, outdone the amount of print copies that he did in his in his first edition. Another example is Professor Adam Schumacher, which was the DBC at Monash University. So at one stage he was actually Nathan's Nathan's boss. Um, he's now at Griffith. Um, he was a DB, uh, He was a dean of the College of um, Arts and Social Sciences here at um, ANU, and as part of starting the press, he also had a book that's called Black Words, White Page. Since us publishing that book, it has been one of the top ten downloads, um, something like consecutive in five years. And Adam... Um, has wonderful stories about how he's had opportunities um, to also write additional work um, in regards to that subject. We've also had another author um, that had, used to publish quite a bit with Cambridge and he then published with the press and he said that that was the smoothest um, satisfying publishing experience that he's ever had in his history as an academic. So, you know, that was, um, that was really good to hear. So there's, there's three, three examples um, that um, I hope you can take something away with you with that. <laughs> Thanks, Lorena. A couple of other questions have come through. Uh, one is uh, to Mal about uh, to elaborate on, on the product being launched today, the, uh, the, the multimedia product, I guess it is. Can you uh, say a bit more about that, Mal? You there, Mal? Yeah. I just had to unmute myself, sorry. Oh, that's all right. Um, what, what we're launching this afternoon is a um, it's the second in a series of nine media objects. Uh, these are uh, launched at UTS. Um, the series editor is from UTS, Dr. Chris Keynes. Um, the editor of the book this afternoon is uh, also a senior lecturer at uh, UTS, Malcolm Angeluki, um, in international studies. And the book that's being launched this afternoon is called Voice Press Absence, and it collects international contributions from academic scholars and practitioners together with recorded live uh, performances of artists, writers, musicians and poets creating this, uh, a space basically that uh, allows for discussion on the role of voice in contemporary humanities. That, that's not possible um, through traditional academic press um, because uh, what Media Object does is it, it focuses on bringing together of um, not just text as, as a traditional press might but also film and sound uh, in one object and uh, generally the, the object is uh, an interactive PDF um, that we've used, uh, but there's also a um, an ebook version that's available for free on the um, on the uh, Apple Books uh, thing. Um, they do get a number of downloads, and, and I, the reason I wanted to give you the numbers is because I, I've been disappointed in the numbers. But when I've talked to um, my colleagues on this panel before, uh, I think during one of our CLPAC discussions, they 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 said, "Oh no, that's a, that's a good number of downloads in the hundreds. That's more than you'd get uh, the sales of, of an academic, a general academic monograph." But it's providing people like um, like. This one this afternoon with a with an a, an academic scholarly reviewed outlet for their work. Um, the previous one that we've launched was on um, audiovisual performance art in Australia, and it's something that is being studied by people in um, in various arts and humanities faculties around Australia. And the next one will feature um, quite a famous uh, artist in lace uh, who works in lace. 
and she has a particular method of creating this lace. Um, in, in, she's a textile uh, academic uh, that's quite famous in, in New South Wales in artistic circles. But you can't write about it. It's something you actually need to see happen because the lace comes out of a big bath and uh, it's, the, it's the process that can't really be described in any other way than, than watching a demonstration. And we can do that through film. So the third one we'll launch later this year will be about Celia's uh, lace work and... Uh, and she's got reviewers in there. And what we're looking at doing with that particular work is providing this free uh, interactive PDF object online. But then uh, we've been cooperating with one of the series designers and editors, Dr Zoe Zadikierski, whose research interest is in um, the interaction between the digital and print media and how they're colliding rather than competing with each other now. So what we'll do with that series is offer a um, an option for people to purchase a uh, a high a high end um, uh, print edition that we've now figured out that we can do on demand for as little as five num uh, five copies for about two hundred dollars each that will include uh, e everything in it that the that the online edition has, but as well as that fabric swatches, so people can actually touch the objects. So it goes right down that sensory path of um, of giving people an experience that's well beyond what you'd normally get from just a traditional book. As well as that, we'll offer, um, uh, uh, if people want an object to take away because she's so popular as an academic, um, in, in particularly in New South Wales, um, and, and as a curator, an arts curator, we'll, we'll offer print-on-demand copies of, of a book uh, for about five bucks um, and, and just see if that works this time. Not to raise revenue, but just because we think there'll be a demand from it. So it's an experiment, uh, and so far it's been fairly successful. But the key people behind it have been Dr Chris Keynes from um, our School of uh, Communications and Dr Zoe Zadikersky, who's a lecturer from the School of Design, at, at keeping these things together. We've been very supportive of them, and they know that, they appreciate that, and uh, they know that it, it involves effort on both their part and our part to bring this series off. And it is truly uh, a major experiment in, ter in terms of um, academic, peer-reviewed, scholarly publishing. Okay, thanks, thanks, Mal. Uh, another question has come through from Nerda Quartermaster QUT, uh, and the question is: Would you share your views on open content licensing of works which are not commercially focused? And I guess part of that is a, is a Creative Commons license question. Um, uh, Lorena, do you use CC at uh, ANU? No, we don't. We have our own terms and conditions, but they're very, very similar to CC. Um, and then we've had a couple of instances that the author has um, been quite um, assertive in regards to having Creative Commons licence, so we have gone ahead with it. Um, it's something that we'll definitely be looking at as part of the open access research policy here at the ANU. Um, and it is definitely something that will be also looked at for digital collections. Right. Does anyone else use uh, Creative Commons? Yep. Yeah. Um, this is Mal again. Yeah. We've, we've just gone through the process of um, uh, making all of our journals qualify for the, the DOAJ seal of OA yeah. quality. And that means that all of the UTSE Press journals have to have a CCBY licence. Um, as well as a number of other things like DOIs, uh, HTML and PDF versions, removal of technical barriers like re re uh, registration, um, use of Authenticate to avoid plagiarism and uh, updating index details for all the journals to include um, listings in DOAJ, Sherpa Romeo, Oaklist, blah, blah, all the rest. Um, so, yeah, we, we're, we've recently done moved straight to CCBY for that. And that's been a process that we've done, but it's been one that we've had to collaborate with the the academics involved, so the, the journal managers and editors, the authors, um, and it's not always popular, uh, po uh, well, popular is one word, I guess, but possible on every single monograph, but we're moving that way with the monographs as well. And so far those um, media objects have been CCBY. Um, Adelaide, we use CC, um, but I don't impose particular CC licence, but uh, I do in the require all authors to allow ACC licence of some kind for their books. And we did that partly so that we could then uh, join and be a full, fully paid up member of uh, OASPA, um, but also for the DOAB, um, etc. 
but I, I don't necessarily. I've, I've had a great discussion with OASCO over the last year and a half over there. They they were insistent that everyone use CCB wine, but I couldn't see why the one particular license should be imposed on an author. Um, but uh, we I do uh, we do use CC of some kind, and I tend to go for the share alike or non commercial as well. Right. We've, uh, this is Ross here, we've um, uh, used kind of commons in, in, in some, some areas, but not other areas at the moment, where even though we do provide um, open access to some content, uh, particularly a series of content that's coming out of our health sciences faculty now about um, occupational health type things which are being uh, used by the, the health services across Australia, um, and they're open access, but it's not only a CC license, I don't think. Um, on DOAJ, the uh, uh, Open Journal uh, Directory, um, we run uh, probably about six or seven open access journals through OJS. The interesting thing, that lots of people to us, is actually for us to digitise the back sets of material and put that up open, and and the uh, the tracking of the, uh, the hits and the profile of, of articles written. 10, 20 years ago, uh, are, are quite impressive for the uh, authors involved. So that kind of back set type uh, digitization and uh, availability through open access is a, um, a surprising driver here for people coming to, to us for OJS. Do you meet the cost of that, Ross, uh, of the digitizing of the backlist? Uh, we have to date. Um, we have a, a situation, interesting situation here where we work very closely with the research portfolio, who also support OJS, and we have a team based in the library employed by the research portfolio who do digitization yeah. for the for ERA and things like that. But they actually do, do the digitization as part of the process. Usually, yep, yep. there's a a set destroyed in the process. This is fairly uh, uh, high speed digitization, um, uh, but. They then uh, uh, move them through the AJS system, and uh, so they're, they're discoverable. So it's, it's an interesting type of relationship between the library and the uh, research portfolio here. Yep. So any other um, questions that come up? There's a couple of other questions uh, that were raised earlier, partly to do with. Um, Researcher attitudes towards um, towards uh, um, open access. Certainly, we when we went through the process here of discussing the open access policy, uh, we did every research committee, every faculty research committee twice to, to get feedback, and essentially the feedback was yeah, in principle support for it all, fantastic. Um, worried about uh, any, uh, here for the ARC and NGMRC mandates, any additional work that need to do. So there's a bit of a, a turn up on that. So we've been trying to develop processes Hello. here where, which minimise which minimize the, um, the work. Um, so it's, I guess this is ongoing discussion in terms around all the campuses, I guess, around open access. Uh, like uh, ANU, we have some champions here, uh, particularly um, uh, Simon Chapman, who's a, a public health person. Um, and there's been interesting work done in terms of uh, material becoming open access to the repository and then social media to, to promote that. And uh, Simon Chapman's with a, a social media tart, and you can see the spikes quite easily when he, um, when, when he starts to... to uh, uh, get his stuff out there through uh, social media. So, do, does anyone else use social media in a sense for uh, promotion? We do. I don't know whether it's that effective at do. UTS. We we certainly push it out there, but um, we've got a couple of journal editors who've got uh, an incredible following because the subject that uh, that 
that they're on, like Latin American studies. Uh, Paul Allotson's got uh, something like I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand followers. So, although he's not a social media tart like um, like Chapman, uh, he certainly, with that many followers, can um, is very powerful in at getting things out there. He's one of our journal managers and editors, and he's an associate dean of um, for teaching and learning in our arts and social sciences area. Good oh, friend yeah. of the library, fortunately. <laughs> yeah. Good. There's certainly been an interesting, and I guess with some established researchers, a lot of younger researchers who use social media, um, open access, open data type yeah. processes fairly effectively, and it's interesting to see them you know, come through and champion open access and support the library uh, yeah. in its various Ross, just um, one uh, one other um, from Sydney University is speaking here. Uh, I guess some of you are all running Open Access Week events this week for Open Access Week. Uh, many of the participants will be doing the same as us. We've got a talk down here tomorrow um, uh, on uh, Open Access by a University of Sydney academic called Alex Hol Holcomb. Yep, I think he's uh, psychology, isn't he, uh, Ross, that, yep. that sort of stuff. But he's a big advocate for Open Access Week and he's doing a talk here called... Um, well, I think it's uh, along the lines of open access, why it will win, why it must win. Uh, and I, it, it, uh, I think it will prove to be, um, be quite an interesting talk tomorrow. Right. Uh, why it must win and how it will win, it's being talked uh, on. He's an associate professor of psychology at University of Sydney. Yeah, he's, but also he, he, has quite a, quite a good following on social media. Yeah, he's been very supportive here as well. He's given some, some talks here. Uh, there's uh, just emerging a, a, a fairly uh, uh, interesting open access YAMA group here at Sydney. It's just started yeah. up by... Smith Ross, as well as, that, as well as those two we've mentioned, I'd, before I went to Alex to ask him to speak here, I asked somebody else up, the, up at Sydney. Um, was it a law guy? Yeah, yeah there's... there's uh, I'm just trying to think of names now. With someone in law, uh, and another person whose who's, uh, whose name eludes me at the moment. Someone very much involved in open open data in, in chemistry yeah. and, and uh, kind of that. Yeah. What's that crowdsourcing of of, of uh, research? Yeah. Um, and he puts that out as, as uh, open data, and then the relationship between uh, and it comes back to something you were mentioned earlier, Mal, about being experimental and yeah. uh, uh, and innovating is relationship between open data and, and publishing and things like that and, and how yeah. uh, we certainly see ourselves in trying to get into that space and position where we can actually merge both publishing uh, and and uh, ways of promoting open data. Yeah, I, I, the reason I mentioned that is I think we made a um, either a tactical or a strategic error some years ago when, when the university moved towards um, a stronger presence in relation to the way it supports research data at UCS. And we, I think it was in a transition between the previous university librarian, who's now the state librarian, and myself here, because I was new to the role uh, and Alex was moving away. We allowed the the technology people to take over the research data area. So they set up an e-research group. And whilst it uh, is quite supportive in terms of infrastructure, what we're seeing now is that um, the technical people are not good at uh, coordinating and, and uh, facilitating collaboration across the university, not like librarians can. And, uh, and I think that's lacking now, and I'm going to have to stride in and, and start to tie that together because it's what I, without being too rude, I think what the technology people do, it really does go back to plumbing, and there's, uh, there's other aspects to tying data back to publications and other things like symplectic and everything else that you, that you might have running or, or um, research master. Within the university, there's, there's a role, a stronger role for that that really is more of a library role than an IT role. And um, we stepped away from that uh, a while back, and we've now got to step back into that fold and bring that open data in as, as uh, it, it has strong relationships to publishing, to the mandate, to the repository, you know, all of that needs a, a stronger role over it than simply a, a data catalogue. It needs, it needs descriptors, it needs to be more, more closely coordinated and, and in a more collaborative way than what the IT people are doing. Yeah, so certainly in Sydney, the um, University Research Data Manager is based in the library and she works in the same uh, 
uh, area department uh, in the, under his scholarship is the press. Yeah. And the, that sounds uh, better to me than our role. It does. So there's a potential there for linkage. We, uh, the, the, the discussion at the moment has been fairly uh, rudimentary, some of around DOIs for data sets. But yeah. uh, ICT, sorry, Central IT at Sydney recognise uh, that curation of data is more a library role than their role. Yeah. And, uh, so we were quite closer with them in terms of they provide the hard infrastructure, we provide the soft infrastructure. Yeah. So, um, any more thoughts uh, on that line in terms of, um, I guess, uh, well, open access publishing is also uh, experimentation innovation in, 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 in that context? Um, what, what I said, one thing I said earlier is I think um, as well as experimenting with formats, uh, this is Mal again from UTS, I think there's a role, um, there's a potential for us to, to uh, relate more strongly to things like aggregators. Uh, I think in many ways the future of the web, you know, many years ago there, was, there were things like RSS, uh, a really simple syndication, everyone had blog readers to pick things up. And now we're finding that that service is coming to us through aggregators and there's various publication aggregators who, who are easy to read at the moment, things like Zeit and, and Flipboard, who I find uh, that's more the future of uh, like news and magazine publishing than, than single individual news banners or, or the traditional newspaper press. What would be really cool for us uh, as open access, and I've tried this a couple of times, as open access publishers, is if we can link into those aggregators and provide uh, more easily read um, outlets for, um, and then rewrite our stuff so it's more easily read by those people, but for the general public to get open access out to the general public. What I tried to do a while back was to get um, the conversation, which is that, uh, that short uh, university written um, mag online magazine newspaper thing. Uh, I, I tried to get them to add widgets to um, short, I think they're 300 word articles that they put up on, on all sorts of topics that were written by academics. Um, and it's fairly widely read now, it's expanded to both the UK and the US. I tried to get them to put a widget up that would link back to open access um, articles or articles in our green repositories to give people a, a, a chance to do deeper reading of what was already available from the universities. So I think that um, that sort of experimentation where we can where we can link in and and really spread this around, not not in, in just a, a social media way, but but providing deep links back to either our journals or our repositories to fully open data uh, and uh, or open research data and, and open research publication um, information. I think that that's, that could be really, really powerful. And to me, that's where the web is going to head. And we need to be, we need to be trying to make that happen now and not, not allow someone else to charge in and, and, uh, and take it over and try to make a buck out of it. Because that's what happened with Gold Open Access. Um, is that the publishers realised that this open access was a threat and so then they charged in and came up with this insane idea where people pay article processing fees in order to have something made open access. So if we, if we don't take the advantage on this one and get our work out there and, and linked openly and, and freely readable um, with these aggregators and new forms of online um, newspaper publication, then I think I fear something else that um, will be done by the Dick Dastardlies of the world who are seeking to make a buck for El Sevier. <laughs> That's right. And, and the rest, we should just pick it up. And the rest, yeah, sorry. Because I noticed uh, at the, re you know, uh, without being too um, uh, naughty, at the... You're uh, fading a bit, John. Um, I just... Well, I, I don't know. Is that any better? I'm trying to work out where the microphone is. Thing is, yeah. Um, the the open access scholarly publishing conference, which was just held in Paris, and I see Mal, you sent one of your yep, staff yep. as well. Yeah, we had Scott Abbott over there. It was really uh, useful for him. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I've been. This is the third one I've been to, and I've noticed since uh, in the last three that the presence of the big publishers, as in those big six, without naming anyone. Has become and, and and you know other commercial publishers has, has increased uh, massively. So they're very very interested in uh, either a whether they can 
uh, stuff allowed, open access, make money yeah. from it, or whatever. But I know it's it's it's, it's not really the area. I'm very curious as to what they're up to. Well, they announced yeah. themselves as uh, in the case of Springer. I went to uh, a seminar where the guy said we're the biggest open access publisher in the world. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that claim. Which sort of might be true in uh, in a in one you know legalistic sense, but uh, whether they're embracing the um, uh, the spirit behind it, I think is obviously another no. question. Last no. year in London, there was a, a person speaking on behalf of Pam McMillan, and. Uh, she was telling us all about the open access program for them. And someone said, well, how many books have you got, have you published? And she said, 18. <laughs> and I thought, I looked up how many books the Pan, Pan McMillan had published in the year to see what percentage were open access to, to, to determine the degree of their commitment, if you like. 1,800 books. So, so the 18 one, was like 1%. One, one percent. So yeah. it wasn't, you know, you know it's just a... Put in the water just to see, just, just to keep an eye on the rest. Of yeah, it, but so that think. see that to me that's that's really uh, really interesting because what you've said, um, John, is not it doesn't surprise me at all. These these people have um, two big advantages over us that we we're not we we just simply can't compete with. One is that they they they're so big that they have business intelligence units, yeah. and those business intelligence units will will obviously be looking at. Uh, open access press and publishing through universities, as and seeing that the what what whether that is a threat and what they can do to counter it, which is why yes. they're at those publishing uh, open publishing conferences now. And the second big advantage they've got is marketing. But but ha having said that, I think we also have to recognise some of the advantages that we've got. Uh, yes. You know, the obvious one is for a start, we the content all comes from universities, not from libraries, but from universities. So if the libraries have deep links, they can start convincing people of the insanity that they're that they're that they're doing at the moment and giving it away in terms of prestige and and reputation only. Um, but we also we also have two other well probably many other advantages. One is our ability to be more agile, and that leads to the to the other one I wanted to mention is the and, and Lorena mentioned it earlier that we can be we can publish in a, a faster way. We can be more responsive to issues of the day uh, and and have a, a much shorter lead time to full on publication than the other the other uh, traditional forms. So I see that as being beneficial. Um, one of the reasons it could be beneficial, uh, it, it, that agility, because we can experiment, probably that's one good reason, but, but also because uh, I, if we can be that agile and get things out when, they're, when the topics are hot, like, you know, for instance, at the moment, Ebola is quite to topical and so is terrorism, um, people can, and we can, we can also then make these things far more interactive than they are at the moment uh, and, uh, and have them as um, almost two-way immediately peer-reviewed things and perhaps a bit more, dare I say it, like Wikipedia than they are at the moment in, yeah. um, in, a, in a, a, you know, a broadcast sense rather than an interactive sense. The other interesting aspect that the, the publishers have expressed interest in as well at the moment is I think they're a bit threatened by altmetrics and they're starting to buy, uh, buy up altmetrics platforms. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, that, that's something that they saw well ahead of us. And uh, yes. I think Elsevier in particular has brought up a couple of the altmetrics areas. Mm. So they're they're really they're really quick at moving to counter any threat to their current business models. Yes, metrics are also you know, for books uh, yeah. virtually impossible. Um, and the one, and the one company that seized upon that a couple of two or three years ago uh, introduced the, the book citation database. So you need to pay twenty thousand dollars a year. To yep. access the, the data yeah. on top of your um, you know, subscriptions or the journals that they already sell, etc. So you know, we Adelaide can't access that. I'm not even not even considering because I think it's some. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's one. Yeah, that's right. They, they, they're very good at that. Yeah. So this is a good segue actually to plug um, a conference being held at ANU next year in March called Reinventing uh, University Publishing. Um, which Lorena's been involved with. Um, do you want to say something, Lorena, about it? <laughs> sure. So the conference will be in March and there is an actual website that people can go to um, to get this information. I don't have the website in front of me, um, 
but if you Google reinventing university presses, I'm sure that it'll be the top, um, the top link um, in Google. Um, and it will have a number of um, international speakers coming along and we will have a panel which will consist of a few of us like today that will be talking about our experiences in um, an e-press or, or should I say a university press and the majority of us are within the library. And, um, yes, it, it'll be very beneficial for, for a number of people, one that, you know, are, are excited about the open access arena, um, for people that are hoping to establish a press within their university structure. Um, and also we're going to have a workshop, or should I say a that camp, on the Thursday. So that, that'll be um, also beneficial for people to ask questions. In it's a word. It's a, Lorena. It's a WordPress site, and if you if you just put reinventing university publishing in, you'll get it. Not presses. Oh, yeah. beg your pardon. Sorry, yeah. publishing. Reinventing um, university publishing. It'll it'll come up as the first result on Google. Beautiful. So I've just sent it to everybody. Oh, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being on it, Susanna. Uh, so yes. So there's um quite a bit of information there already, and where we have a subcommittee as. Um, I don't think we've spoken about this, but um, CAUL, which is C-A-U-L, has a group called the CAUL Library Publishing Advisory Committee, um, and we discuss things about, you know, our publishing um, strategies within our university. It's within a really that... august group. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> a very selective, august and elite organisation. Absolutely. That's why Mal's on it. Yeah. And then we've and, got... And Ross and, and John. Ross and John. That's and right. Nathan. Yeah. And Lorena. <laughs> and Lorena. <laughs> so within that group, we have a subgroup that consists of myself, Roxanne, Ross and Agata from University of, um, Sydney, uh, University of Sydney. And this little subcommittee is basically looking at the nitty gritty of the, of the symposium and we get together quite regularly and chat on on our milestones to get this symposium under control by March next year. So um, I'm pretty sure um, we extended the um, open to, you know, if anyone wants to come and speak at the, at the symposium. So if you want to go and look at the deadline and if you are keen in speaking at the symposium, please um, apply um, and then... Um, Roxanne will will let you know um, if you have been successful or not. The purpose. Um, I'm going to have to start wrapping this up soon because our hour is just about finished. Um, do we have just a few last words from everybody, perhaps about where next for open access? Ross. Uh, I think um, uh, I think one of the areas that we've kind of alluded to is. Um, uh, publishing around open data, shared data and publishing itself and there's a whole lot of uh, discussion going on about data as, data as, uh, as publication um, and I think how that the, the link between, as Mel's been indicating, between the textual and the multimedia and other kinds of data is a way that's going to be uh, a, a place where we should be looking towards uh, in the next year or so. I, I, I think I've said enough, so I'll let someone else have a go. All right, John? Um, no, no, I think I've said it too. <laughs> okay, Lorena? I think um, in regards to ANU, we, um, we're we hoping that ANU e-text takes off, so um, that's electronic textbooks, and the reason for this is it, it is part of the MOOCs um, you know, thing that's happening around around the world. So th that will also assist with um, providing an, an extra avenue for our scholars here at the ANU in publishing their textbooks. So I think that's, that's another area of open access that might take off. The other one is obviously multimedia, which, you know, Mao's talked a lot about, and we're very keen in um, exploring you know, additional um, technology and avenues in regards to that. Fantastic. And that's it. 
I think generally in relation to open access, the uh, the future is bright within the university uh, especially. I note that the Mellon Foundation, which is talking about putting uh, many millions of dollars into uh, humanities publishing, is uh, talking about that as a um, uh, an open access initiative with uh, with enriched content of um, of whatever kind. Uh, so I think that uh, within the university, that that is seen as broadly the future. And I think it's there's more of a, a clear case for it, even uh, in in relation to the natural sciences, where the the example that Mal mentioned of the libraries, uh, universities uh, paying for the research and then buying it back at massive, um, massively inflated costs. Uh, you know, that's ultimately that um, you would think that that uh, can't continue indefinitely in the way that it is. And conventional publishing within the trade for you know, bookshops uh, for ordinary buyers. I think that that's a bit more of a, an open question as to how that's how that's uh, going to play out with with open access. Um, but uh, uh, I could go on about it for. Uh, I'd need to go on about it for some time, so I won't. That's right. Maybe we should get you into the webinar just on that. Oh yes. <laughs> well, I'd like to take the chance now, on behalf of the um, AOASG, to thank all of you for your time this afternoon, um, both to all of the presenters and everybody who came in and listened. It's been a wide-ranging and very intriguing um, discussion. So thank you so very much to everybody, and um, thank you again to the panelists. Thank you, Susanna, thank you. for organising this. Yeah. Thank you.